So good afternoon now, good morning. We are, we're going to, we're going to start. Um, so Dr. Mackey has joined us uh, as well as uh, all the other panelists uh, that I will introduce, including uh, Madam Christina Duarte, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Special Advisor on Africa. So I'm just gonna um, introduce very briefly, you know, why this topic, and then uh, I will give the, give the floor to uh, the high table, uh, Dr. Mayaki and Madame Duarte, uh, to address, uh, you know, the, the different participants, including the panelists. And subsequently, I will introduce the panelists. And after the presentation of uh, Dr. Mayaki and Madame Duarte, uh, the panelists will be invited to answer several questions that we review with them already. And uh, I would kindly ask them before they answer the question to give us a little bit of information about their background because I'm just gonna read out their title and I think they will be best positioned to talk about what they do uh, for the benefit of all of us. So our, our social fabric, our nation's economic performance, uh, regional cooperation framed by multilateralism and productivity are undergoing catalytic disruptions right now. Alongside these changes, digital transformation is poised to convert our economies and improve our societies. To leverage these positive outcomes, we must move well beyond our current activities and be at the forefront as change agents of our nation's prosperity and competitiveness. Subsequently, increasing African countries' competitiveness will be consequential to more inter-African trade, peace and security, among others. Investment and improvement in digital transformation should be catalytic to the well-being of African citizens, with the potential to transform all sectors and forms of economic activity. We should not miss that opportunity. The fourth industrial revolution is the fourth major industrial era since the initial industrial revolution of the 18th century. It can be described as a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital and biological worlds and impacting all disciplines, economies and industries. Central to this revolution are emerging technology breakthrough in fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, the internet of things, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, quantum computing and nanotechnology. One of the strategic goals of the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, is to build a knowledge for development hub underpinned by a multi-stakeholder multi cooperation to develop policy frameworks and advanced collaboration that accelerate the benefits of digital transformation to Africa in this day and age that collides with COVID-19. The purpose of our gathering today is to codify and capture the knowledge from our August panelists on the critical role of digital transformation in Africa in the post-COVID-19 era in order to leverage that potential to accelerate application of practical digital solutions at scale with the impact on jobs and livelihoods. In other words, how Africa could leverage digital transformation to accelerate and sustain its recovery from COVID-19. I would like to warmly welcome, thank and appreciate our distinguished panelists to whom inspiring reverence and admiration I shall acknowledge on behalf of the African Union Development Agency for their ongoing contribution to the development of our continent, Africa, and for the time they are making for us today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Madame Christina Duarte and the Secretary General Special Advisor on Africa to the United Nations Secretary General who's a special guest to Dr. Mayaki, the CEO of African Youth Development Agency. Um, Professor Yaya Gassama, 
professor in, bio, in plant biotechnology at University of Sheikh Antajob and chair of the African Union High Level Panel on Emerging Technologies and vice chair of the National Science Academy of Senegal, Professor Fulu Fellow Nen Womondo, Executive Cluster Manager of the South Africa Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, known for as CSIR, focus on the next generation of enterprise and institutions. Nakutula Lukele from the World Economic Forum, who's a lead data in digital transformation, focusing on digital economy and new value creation. Mr. Jacques DeVos, CEO of Med Medzenin Volocom Africa, and Mr. Brandon Pasquale, Vice President of Innovation at the Launch Lab of the University of Stellenbosch. Um, Dr. Maiki, I would invite you to, to take the floor uh, to introduce yourself to those of us who don't know you, and subsequently introduce uh, Madam Christina Duarte before I take back the floor and uh, introduce the panelists. Over to you. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you, Tala. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to welcome you all to this uh, first uh, Auda Nepad uh, post COVID 19 knowledge series, uh, focusing on how Africa could leverage digital transformation to accelerate and sustain its recovery uh, from COVID 19. Uh, and I would particularly like to enhance uh, the presence of uh, Under Secretary General Christina Duarte who was accepted to, uh, to be with us in order to deliver a, a keynote speech. And uh, our dear sister, Professor Yaye Kenny Gassama, who has been uh, leading uh, the working processes of a panel on emerging technologies with uh, such passion and uh, dedication. And evidently, all the esteemed uh, panelists who have a wealth of experience and who will, who will help us uh, reflect better, uh, design better solutions, and uh, interact uh, for the benefit of all those who are participating in this knowledge series. Uh, the African Union Development Agency was uh, a product of a reform of the African Union, which was led by President Kagame. And the, the main reason for the creation of uh, uh, Auda Nepad was to harness knowledge in the objective of uh, designing our own solutions uh, in our own strategies, development strategy, whether it is in energy, transport, health, education, agriculture, uh, trade. So for us, uh, as a development agency, uh, the, the, the space occupied by knowledge is much more important than it could be for other development agencies in other regions of the world. Uh, because Africa has been fundamentally uh, behaving in its development trajectory on the basis of mimetism. Mm. And uh, mimetism has its uh, positive aspects because it can allow uh, uh, to uh, a certain number of shortcuts and to get to solutions that are practical. But mimetism philosophically can be a hindrance if it doesn't allow to collect the proper knowledge which is uh, derived uh, from our interventions on the ground. And uh, as you know, when we talk about digital transformation, uh, many experiences uh, are uh, being developed within the continent, which are not always captured by formal public entities, uh, which are uh, uh, disseminated and dispersed, but uh, not always connected 
And that has had a, 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 a serious impact on the way uh, governments have designed uh, uh, their, uh, their policies in, in that domain, whether in terms of research, innovation, uh, uh, IT. Uh, these uh, uh, policies usually uh, were designed in a top-down processes and not taking into account the experiences that were developed uh, by innovators, um, uh, whether they had, uh, uh, they were educated for it or whether they were not educated for it. But innovation is taking place. So you have an innovation which is taking place in our environment, in our context, not always captured properly uh, by public entities in order to feed the policy design processes. And uh, you have research centers who are working on developing uh, uh, solutions based on the construction of a specific knowledge. Uh, and uh, you have a private sector, uh, which uh, for all the reasons of uh, uh, existence of a private sector is going through processes of innovation uh, in order to uh, mm -hmm capture markets in order to have uh, 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 technological solutions to uh, problems that they are facing. So uh, our main intention as a, as a uh, development agency is to harness this knowledge and channel it towards a critical uh, 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 juncture points where it will produce a significant added value. Now we are faced with the challenge of the pandemic and the pandemic uh, did reveal uh, structural weaknesses of a continent. And in these structural weaknesses uh, is the digital divide. We realized suddenly that uh, in health solutions, in uh, education solutions, in energy solutions, uh, in uh, well access to finance solutions, uh, the innovations uh, uh, that uh, we were counting on in order to uh, face the, the, the pandemic, these solutions did exist, but we could do better. And I think one of, uh, one of, the, one of the aims of, of this, uh, of this uh, um, uh, interaction is to look at uh, uh, the different ways in which we can do better. And uh, many things have already been done. I, I will just go through a, a certain number of solutions on the healthcare front, uh, digital solutions such as m and money waived already effectively impacting on access uh, to and quality of financial services have helped in minimizing the spread of a virus by enabling cashless practices. Uh, on the education front, uh, several schools and universities across the continent are moving some of their learning programs to remote learning through online platforms. In South Africa, for example, MTN Foundation invested in the e-learning platform uh, uh, in terms of access to finance, uh, we see increasing application of digital solutions. Fourth, uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution technological innovations are providing, as I was saying at the beginning, multiple solutions. Uh, in Uganda, mobile technology is leveraged to support local businesswomen in selling their goods and produce for online markets. Uh, other initiative to support human capital are Egypt's national cash transfer program, Takaful and Karama that rewards vulnerable families with financial support. So many uh, innovations are taking place in the continent. How do we uh, create, I, I will end by formulating three, three questions. Uh, what could be 
the conditions allowing an optimal ecosystem to uh, help disseminate, integrate, and connect these uh, innovations. Uh, the, the, the second question beyond the, uh, the ecosystem, how can our research institutions, uh, some many are public and some are private, how can they uh, work together, uh, cooperate uh, adequately uh, to help governments better understand uh, the necessity to fast track uh, uh, the instruments of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. It, it's, it is a, a very important point. And lastly, um, Africa is a continent which has a median age of 19 years old. Uh, the creativity of this youthful population is extremely important. Uh, I stand to be corrected, but I, I, I read that we have roughly, uh, according to some data, uh, uh, 400 million uh, smartphones which are being used in this continent. And uh, these instruments are not always, it has to be said, uh, used in connection to development itself. They are used for communication, interpersonal communication, but not always for development. So there is a, 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 a space uh, where we can uh, inculcate, educate, uh, demonstrate, but using these instruments for development can, can be a full win-win uh, 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 formula for the users and for the environment in which, in which they are. So these are my remarks uh, uh, framed within this perspective. How can we as a development agency provide the necessary knowledge uh, to the African Union in order to uh, uh, work towards uh, resolving digital divide, in order to uh, provoke a stronger digital transformation, and in order to anticipate on the uh, enormous changes that will come, but we are not always aware of. So it's a question of preparing ourselves for the future by building a knowledge that is adaptable to this future. So thank you uh, very much, Tala, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baeki. Very, uh, very interesting uh, and insightful uh, remark observation. And I think uh, you, you're helping us to chart uh, the way forward in terms of uh, thinking out of the box and uh, capitalizing on, on the knowledge that exists on the continent. When you talk about the harnessing, I think it's something that we, that we all aim to, to, to do. And uh, the, the opportunity today to have practitioners uh, from different horizon policymakers working on the, on, the, on the opportunities, I would say, for Africa to leverage digital transformation is quite unique. So our panelists are composed by many of those and we'll have a chance and opportunity right after the uh, statements by Madame Duarte to delve or deep dive into those questions uh, that you have prepared. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, the three set of questions that you ask actually cover pretty much or uh, pave the way for those questions, 12 questions that you're going to ask to the different panelists. Uh, it's my pleasure now to invite uh, Madame Christina Duarte and the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations Special Advisor to uh, the Secretary, UN Secretary General. So Madame Duarte, you have the floor. So you will give us uh, the chance to, to hear from you about your new position, which I think uh, comes with a lot of expectations. 
uh, to share that with us. We have lots of us who don't know who you are. I mean, that position rather, I would say, uh, before uh, going into your uh, remarks. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tawa. And good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon to my dear brother, Mayaki. It's always a pleasure, Mayaki, to, to be together with you discussing Africa, that I strongly believe that is our preferred subject and uh, at the end of the day, our passion, our passion. Um, uh, and with your permission, Tala, I will start my, my remarks. Okay. Uh, let me start by reminding what everybody knows or knew before COVID-19. Because COVID-19 has not brought digitalization to Africa. Um, first, before COVID-19, it is or it was I widely recognized that digitalization uh, is one of the most powerful tools to promote inclusive development. Second, digital applications have the potential, everybody knows, of driving socioeconomic transformation, increasing efficient production and distribution of goods and services, opening up new opportunities for income generation for millions of poor people. Sir, we also knew before COVID-19 that Africa is still the least connected region compared to other regions of the world, with about 28.2% internal coverage and only 34% to mobile broadband. Few citizens have digital IDs. Business adopting digital technologies remains the exception, not the rule. And few governments are investing strategically in developing digital infrastructure, services, skills, and entrepreneurship. Fourth, according to, according to some estimated, if internet access reaches the same level of penetration as mobile phone, phones, Africa's GDP could get a boost of up to $300 billion. The last fact that everybody knew before COVID-19 is that better access to technology could be a game changer for development and the closing of the income inequality gap in Africa. This everybody knew before COVID-19. Then COVID-19 has landed in Africa, created disruptions, and forcing policymakers uh, to adopt digital solutions to face essentially the health and education crisis brought by COVID-19. And I would like to stress this idea, if you allow me. COVID-19 created disruptions, forcing policymakers to adopt digital solutions. But those digital solutions were already here much before COVID-19. And these include, for example, telephone-based applications for contact tracing in Kenya, drones spreading message in rural, in rural areas in Cote d'Ivoire, and the delivery of samples to medical laboratories in Ghana and Rwanda. So the COVID-19 pandemic has indeed underlined the crucial importance of connectivity and digital solutions across the world. In fact, the UN Secretary General states in a very clear way that the future will be much more digital than the past after COVID-19. So looking ahead, digital technologies will form an important component for sustaining the continent's recover from COVID. From data sharing, data dashboards, such, such as the ones used by the, by, the disease, by the disease control and prevention centers. Contact tracing is a crucial but complicated 
and time-consuming aspect of controlling an outbreak. And during this pandemic, a wide array of digital tools have been developed in Africa to cut down on the manpower needed to manage these processes. Telemedicine, more than 400 million people in Africa live with little or no access to healthcare. Half of this population lives in rural areas but only one quarter of doctors in Africa are deployed there. Technologies such as wearable and sensors, as well as telemedicine, are opening possibilities for easier monitoring of individuals' health in remote areas. Education is all another, another example, as well as business transformation. So these are the examples that COVID-19 push policy makers uh, uh, in terms of adopting digital solutions to provide, to cope with the COVID-19 and all the crises that COVID-19 brought. As I used to say, COVID-19 is a package, is an integrated package of, of crises. But COVID-19 has also disrupted socioeconomic paths and aggravated dramatically Africa's financial constraints. No fiscal space, weak, not to say very weak, domestic resource mobilization institutions, no fair access to international financial markets, pushing countries for debt relief and debt suspension solutions to cope with the financial distress, with the financial crisis. So, now we reach a point that we need to think about recovering better, as the UN Secretary General has mentioned. And to recover better, policy making in Africa should take these disruptive opportunities and together with digital technologies to address the serious bottlenecks on financing for development from inside. And I'd like to stress this idea. Policymaking in Africa should take these disruptive opportunities brought from COVID-19 to establish a sort of complicity, I would say alliance with digital technologies to address the serious bottlenecks on financing for development, but from inside. Not, not asking money from outside, but keeping Africa's money from leaving the continent. So the question that I believe policymaking should now be addressing from a financing for development standpoint, having digital technologies available are the following. How can digitalization or digital economy be used to address the gaps in financing for development? How can digitalization be used to revamp domestic resource mobilization? How can digitalization be used to address the illicit financial flows? Particularly knowing that digital te technologies facilitate illicit financial flow at each stage. Be it earning money illegally, transferring illegal funds, or using them. There are several, several areas where clear links between technology, digital technology, and illicit financial flows can be established. And the amounts are huge. Just to give you an idea, the African Development Bank estimates that since 1980, Africa has lost on in corporate taxes more than one trillion. More than one trillion. The last UNCTAD report, just published two weeks ago, puts, the num puts a quite painful number on our table. Almost 
90 billion dollars a year. So, we strongly believe that digital, digital technologies could be also considered as a tool to tackle the problems of the illicit financial flows. They can serve as a source of empowerment and transparency and could be used in investigations, detectives, etc. Why I'm addressing in this workshop, in this knowledge workshop, digitalization and illicit financial flows or financing for development. Because being a policymaker for more than 20 years, it is today my conviction that to address sustainable development in Africa, we policymakers need to address before sustainable financing. We need to address before the lack of our ownership on fiscal flows, economic flows, and financial flows. This is the only way to face situations without begging for debt relief and without begging for debt suspension. Recognizing how important these two measures are in the short term to cope, to cope with the current, the current crisis. So the digital economy from a policy, policy making standpoint is the, a double edged sword, but it's completely unavoidable. It is no longer a policy option, but a policy obligation for a couple of reasons. First, policy making needs to better understand what is the digital economy. There are four, five dimensions that are critical to understand. There are four or five dim dimensions of digital economy that are cri critical to understand from a policy making standpoint so that we can identify the policy risks and identify at the same time the mitigants. Digital economy is essentially dematerialization, is disintermediation, is disruption, is convergence. So, and policy making needs to be conscious the risks brought by these features of digital economy, recognizing at the same time that it is no longer a policy option, but a policy obligation if you want to survive in a such high competitive, competitive world. Second issue that I would like to brought about policy making, digital, digital economy and financing for development is the fact that policy making should avoid, according to me, should avoid to approach digitalization only from a consumer standpoint. Positioning Africa as a huge and growing consumption digital technology market for overseas company, companies is not the best way to grab this opportunity. Uh, it's not because we are beautiful people that all big high tech companies have, as of today we are talking, they are implementing very aggressive market penetration strategies in Africa. Google, Microsoft, Facebook, etc. We need to be very careful from a policy making standpoint, recognize the risks associated to digital economy, recognize the opportunities that are challenged by these risks. And I give you, a, I just gave, um, I just gave you an example. Positioning Africa as a huge and growing consumption, consumption, digital technology market for overseas companies. I will not develop, but I'd like just to mention the continental free trade area. 
the intellect that will be, I hope, will be addressing intellectual property barriers are the fundamental importance to mitigate the I think we have a little bit of connectivity problem and I think my colleagues will just try to resume the connection um, in order for Madame Duarte to, you know. Are you back, Madame Duarte? We, we lost you a little bit. I'm here. Okay, okay, so we lost you I'm for a few seconds. I'm about to finish, Tala. Okay. The first issue with the last one, that for me is one of the most important. And these are related to the first, the second, and the third. To address these three risks that I just mentioned, good knowledge of what is digital economy. Trying to avoid to position in Africa essentially as a growing construction digital technology market and the importance of uh, digitalization in terms of re regional global value chains and global value chains, there is one issue that is crucial. And I will stop here. SDG 16, institutions. In order to cope with these risks, we need to have the courage to build strong state regulatory capabilities. Otherwise, with all my due respect, will be just be eaten by Google's, Facebook's, and Microsoft's. So we need to build strong state regulatory capabilities. First. Second, we need to implement strong education policies with a strong focus on digital knowledge. We need to start, to start introducing digital knowledge from a five-year-old child. Let's prepare the next generation. Digital economy is a medium long term marathon. Third, we need to create proper but competitive legal market uh, framework. The last one, we need to build with the private sector very balanced and strategic partnerships. The private sector should recognize that at this stage, and due to COVID-19, the only exit out for everybody is to partner on a, on a transparent and balanced way with the, public, with the public sector. The PPPs, where the risk stays with the state and the profit with the private, will no longer be sustainable after COVID-19. After COVID Thank you, thank you very much, uh, my dear brother, my Akin and my Tal. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Very, very inspiring words. And um, I see sort of, um, you know, a roadmap with a lot of mappings that we need to do, connecting the dots between the policy, policy options uh, and transiting from policy option with regard to digital transformation to policy obligation. I think it's well noted. Uh, looking at actually the challenges and opportunities offered or that we're facing uh, because of uh, the digital transformation, but rather piggybacking on the many opportunities to accelerate the transformation, I think that uh, fits well with the theme of this, of this dialogue. Um, looking at also, you know, the connection with the AGZ 16, uh, which is actually one of the focuses of one of the centers of excellence established by the African Union Development Agency, where we're focusing on uh, developing, reinforcing the capabilities or capacities of institutions. So we have a center of excellence that is focused uh, widely so on that one. And I think there would be a very good opportunity uh, for many organization, AUDA and different partners joining us today to, to latch on that recommendation and work with OSA to ensure that actually 
the framework that you're going to put together uh, will be cognizant of the risk that you talk about, that you've highlighted, the opportunities, and connecting them with national development priorities as well as the SDGs and the African Union 2063 goals. Uh, my colleague uh, Martin will actually um, sort of summarize uh, the contribution from the different uh, panelists, and I think he's going to be he's he's busy right now, trying to trying to cope with the depth and the richness of what you've talked about. I think um, at some point uh, down the line, uh, we'll give you back the floor to talk a little bit about OSA because I have questions coming from uh, different participants asking what is it that OSA does and uh, we'll get back to you on that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to invite um, Mr. Jacques DeVos, uh, who's a panelist, who's the CEO of uh, Medzanin Vodacom Africa. The reason why I would like to start with Jacques is uh, Jacques is a practitioner and really very well versed in terms of uh, connecting policy uh, recommendations or policy options uh, in this area and uh, also been involved in rolling out applications in partnership with member states across the continent. And the first question that I have actually for Jack uh, is how can fourth industrial revolution uh, slash digital uh, transformation be prioritized in Africa and be leveraged in the African context to better address COVID-19 and other similar pandemics, these disasters. What tools, uh, you know, solution uh, could be used and how, and how disconnect to, uh, you know, uh, the pathway that Dr. Meaki actually alluded to earlier and some of the risks and challenges as well as opportunities that Madame Duarte just highlighted. Jacques, uh, the floor is yours. And please give us just a quick uh, brief introduction of uh, who you are and what your company does. Over to you, Jacques. Thank you, um, Chair Tala, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for the opportunity. Very brief introduction. Um, Jacques de Vos, uh, joining from South Africa today, uh, representing an organization in the name of Mezzanine. Um, Mezzanine is a subsidiary of the Vodacom Group. And our mandate is really to support the respective Vodacom, Vodafone footprint markets in Africa in leveraging the power and the reach of mobile in strengthening the hand of government and private enterprise uh, stakeholders in Africa. So my background is technical and as Tala indicated, we've been delivering digital enabled solutions for the last 15 years across uh, 13 different African markets, uh, working alongside policymakers, uh, government stakeholders, development agencies, and very important entrepreneurs that in my view is, is the key ingredient for, for, um, uh, for transforming or translating a technology benefit into economic benefit for the citizens of, of Africa. So the comments that were shared as part of the introduction, I would like to commend um, the importance of building solutions for Africa um, in Africa. So using African companies, entrepreneurs, service providers in solving day-to-day -day challenges that, that we experience in the continent. So uh, Tala, a couple of things, um, and I'll just mention a, a few to, to, to kick off the discussion today, because I think there's, there's different elements that we can discuss, but it's, it's about the ability to connect the dots. Um, and during the last nine months, we've been supporting six, uh, different countries uh, with different COVID interventions, uh, primarily looking at, at uh, the health industry and the, the use, using mobile technology to, to increase access to services, um, using mobile technology to provide access to food. So from a food security point of view, um, both in a rural and in, in an urban setting. And then very important also use digital and mobile in delivering our education services. Um, and then as a horizontal capability, uh, financial services. And what we've seen is quite encouraging is that we refer to it as first time users during this period. In some of these sectors have increased with, with up to 22%. 
if you look at the use of mobile for financial services, for example, or banking as a traditional reference. Um, so that although we have seen a lot of uh, uptake of these capabilities prior to COVID, a lot of usage was around social media. Um, we've had earlier reference to Facebook and Google. Uh, what we've now seen is really shifting uh, towards a productivity tool and, and using a GSM mobile capability to, to work. Um, a lot of us had to, to work from home setting and I'll continue to work from home setting. And this has really changed our thinking around the role of mobile um, in, in uh, growing economies and, and uh, supporting different key critical functions in, in, in government. Um, one of the benefits of supporting different markets with, with uh, uh, the same type of intervention, and I'll be very practical in order to, to uh, um, bring this point home. Let's say, for example, use of mobile to improve access to um, the personal protection equipment for our frontline health workers or the use of mobile to provide training services for community health workers, or using mobile technology to reduce the turnaround time of a lab, a COVID lab tests, and, and reducing the risk of, of um, secondary um, transmission. Um, now, deploying these same interventions into the different markets, into the different regions, economic regions in Africa, what we've seen is that different countries had a different return in investment. Um, and the contributing factor here is, and this is, I think, connecting the dots, is that the notion of parachuting a digital capability into a new market or into a new segment and to expect the return on investment, uh, whether it's improve food security or improve quality of care or access to care or improve education outcomes, is, I think, a, a lost investment. Um, it's only in the environments where we have the, what we refer to as the enabling building blocks in place, where we see a return on investment on a digital, on a digital intervention. So important, and just to mention a few, we've heard earlier um, from Madame Duarte around human capital, uh, uh, the import, uh, e readiness, uh, ability to use these tools, these productivity tools, whether it's in education, classroom setting, uh, setting or in a, in a primary healthcare setting. Um, the importance of being able to transact with a digital identity. So I think we've, we've highlighted the benefits of mobile money um, and it's encouraging to see the latest stats, statistics that I've looked at indicate that we've got 145 million mobile money accounts in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that is out of a, a subscriber base of just below 500 million. Um, so the ability to transact with a digital identity. Now, this is a key enabler for us to deliver digital services to a consumer and to a citizen. Um, policy, uh, regulations, issues around data sovereignty. And these are contributions that different industry stakeholders need to, to make in order for uh, government and or private enterprise to receive a return on investment uh, uh, in a digital intervention. And then just to, to close off, um, so today we've got about, what, 1.5 billion people in Africa. Um, there's just north of 800 million of, of these citizens that's got access to GSM services from a coverage point of view. So there's still a massive investment required from us as, as technology providers and telco companies in providing access to, to these services and the benefit of digital, especially in the rural areas. And it's in this regard where I believe partnerships are key in bringing the benefit of digital as, a, as an enabler to, to rural environments. I'm happy to, to, to contribute to this discussion and be part of this discussion. And if there's any questions at the later stage, I'm happy to, to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacques. 
I'm just uh, muting myself. Uh, so I'm going to actually uh, ask uh, another question to, uh, or my second question will go rather to, to Madam uh, Kinegasama. Uh, we, we recall earlier the questions or the three questions, one among the three questions from Dr. Mayaki and Christina Duarte related to the policy options, uh, the policy formulation and the connection between uh, the policies and, um, and, and the solutions which Jacques related alluded to earlier. So Madame, Madame Gassama, uh, what mechanism uh, are being, or do you think should be used to engage uh, local entrepreneur and startup? And I say, uh, I would say even going beyond, beyond those two dimensions, uh, the youth uh, in, including. So what mechanism are being used to engage local entrepreneur, startups and the youth? Madame Gassama, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tala. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, but before that, I would like to uh, magnify the great support of His Excellency Ibrahim Mayaki, CEO African Union, AUDA Nepal. Support to the work of IBET. And we are grateful to His Excellency for his continuous engagement for harnessing innovation and emerging technologies in achieving the Africa we want. And I would like also to thank him for his insightful message, message along with Mrs. Christina Duarte. Uh, for this question, I would like to say, for what policies would be required to stimulate local solutions rather than dependency on big, this is a question also. So what mechanism, well, this is the first question. Uh, although the most impacted in job sectors during this pandemic, small and medium enterprises have been touted as solutions to taking Africa out of economies, economic rules, this pandemic creates. And during these months of confinement, we learn how to live differently, to consume, to educate in the, another way. And in this new form of self-reappropriation, SMEs and startups have played a crucial role in creating the link between individuals in order to meet their needs, the basic needs. Containment has revealed the potential to reinvent of these SMEs and digital startups. So we must learn from this confinement and extend the good practices experiences during the confinement. It is on these digital SMEs and startups that we must build a digital economy by increasing their numbers on the continent in order to support the likely positive impact. So there is a need to empower African youth, to build models based on digital technologies for the existing local challenges. Africa's youthful populations are the greatest determinants of adequate capacity for the effective harnessing of innovation and emerging technologies. Such youth projects should be supported as uh, have been said by Jack DeVos, by the private cooperative firms like telecom companies should be supported by academia, by philanthropic associations, government, ministries. And this will ensure that the right digital models are built for the right problem for the right communities. Uh, yes, I forgot to present myself. Um, Yaiken Gassama, and I'm um, professor in uh, plant biotechnology. Uh, right now, I'm acting as chair of the African Union High Level Panel on Emerging Technologies. And we are promoting many digital solutions like uh, artificial intelligence, of course, uh, like uh, drones, uh, 
And this, like also uh, microgrid, which are using artificial intelligence uh, to connect uh, on grids and uh, the automation have a optimal impact on villages, uh, remote villages mainly. Uh, it is important to uh, enhance this, this kind of model. Models based on technology, but technology alone is not enough. We need to build on this social uh, context, to build it and to rely on this capacity, mainly youth capacity, to develop these ideas. So it is um, this kind of approach where we use uh, technology as a driver in a context which is an African context, uh, mainly uh, uh, characterized by uh, poverty, by lack of education, uh, education which is not uh, very high quality. So we need to build on all this. Uh, and uh, let me say also that um, we need some policies. Policies which are um, identified uh, in four priority areas to accelerate application on practical solutions at scale with impact on jobs. The third priority, the first priority area in digital transformation, I say in policy perspective, is first leveraging the right workforce through so skilling, reskilling, or upskilling. Second, harnessing Africa's useful population. Three, leveraging public-private partnership. It's very important. And five, creating an enabling environment through active governance. Active governance is infrastructure first, in academia, build strong infrastructures and have an education of quality. Active go governance is also liaising with uh, in partnership with the private sector to create business models around these digital technologies. Active governance is also uh, thinking about the regulation, because there is, um, for all these um, digital uh, technologies, there is a good, uh, good side and also uh, a bad side. So we need to have strong regulation, uh, regulating a fair framework uh, to deal with all the issues that will, that can, uh, that, that can, uh, could be bring this could be brought by these technologies. So these are some ideas we would like to um, uh, maybe to discuss uh, deeply uh, around uh, some emerging technologies uh, as uh, artificial intelligence, drones, and, and, and microgrid. Uh, thank you, Tala. And, uh, okay. thank, thank you very much, Madame Gassama, very inspiring. Um, and actually, um, it's a good transition for, for me actually to, to, to let you know that uh, very recently the African Union Development Agency has started the operationalization of the Center of Excellence on Focus on Science, Technology and Innovation, uh, which being operationalized in partnership with CSIR and, and the University of Stellenbosch uh, in, in South Africa. And it's a focus is gonna go actually beyond our regulatory framework in uh, related to digital transformation that was appealed by uh, Madame Duarte, but also looking at uh, partnership ecosystem building uh, to get to a point where, you know, the right solutions, the right partnership ecosystem is put in place to, uh, to drive the adoption of digital technology, digital information, digital transformation and technologies. So that, that, that helps me actually to connect my next question that will be addressed to Professor Fulu Fellow uh, from CSIR, uh, connected to the first question that Dr. Mayaki uh, introduced, you know, the conditions that allow actually uh, the flourishing of an ecosystem to speed up innovation uh, that we leverage through partnerships and the role of government 
Uh, Madam Duarte talk about the regulatory frameworks where the role of government is important. And I alluded to the center of excellence that we have uh, set up and operationalizing in Nairobi that is focused on institutions uh, development and human capital development. And the question relates to how could governments, African governments capacities for digital transformation be harnessed by leveraging through uh, uh, partnership and leveraging force industrial revolution. Uh, the question is for Prof. Uh, Nero Mundo. Over to you, Prof. Good afternoon, moderator. Uh, maybe just to start with my quick introduction, I'm Furupelo Nero Mundo, and I'm at the CSIR where I'm responsible for a cluster called Next Generations Enterprises and Institutions. Within this cluster, generally, we, we look at uh, ICT platforms and the four IR technologies um, with the primary aim of improving um, transparencies and efficiencies in government. We also uh, host the National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System uh, for the country. Uh, but importantly, we're also linked to the, uh, to the South African Affiliate Center, which is the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is a WEF Affiliate Center. With that, I'll just jump straight to the question that you asked me, which is quite interesting, uh, because I think one particular issue that's very, uh, perhaps that's, that's worth highlighting um, is, is that we're very much aware that if you look at the African government, uh, African, uh, African gov uh, governments, um, in general, we are solving very similar problems. It seems like it's very clear uh, that we know what our problems are. Perhaps the challenge that might be there at the moment lies largely on the gap between knowing what we have to do and doing it. So in terms of uh, what we can do to leverage these capacities, I think a particular challenge that we've seen, um, and this is across the continent in the projects that we've led, you see that, as I've mentioned, we're solving very similar problems, but we do those in a very siloed approach. Siloed approach where you find a similar problem that's being solved in um, Zambia of identity. It's very it's the same challenge that Nigeria is trying to solve on the identity issues. And the bigger issue then becomes, how do we address this kind of challenges together? One particular aspect in terms of then le uh, leveraging this is that we are very much clear and we're very much aware that we're trying to get Africa that has some element of strategic independence. We are all talking about similar issues of how do we build homegrown systems? How do we localize technologies? How do we, how do we deal with uh, uh, issues of when we buy technologies, we must just be, uh, we should not just be blind users, but we should be uh, moving towards being smart consumers of such uh, technologies where we understand the limitations and we don't just import what doesn't work for us. So in that, I think the bigger challenge lies in how do we then make sure that we can work together? And of course, when I say together, it's not just in the government element. It talks about, for instance, how do we bring, and this aspect that has been raised several times uh, this afternoon, the issue of the private public partnerships, which are very critical. Uh, issues of, for instance, making sure that even the government uh, knows that it's not gonna have the full capacity but can we then leverage on people who might be uh, in, in the private sector, not just for the business element, but in time to solve the problems of the society together? Because it seems like there's a, there's a very strong uh, commitment from all spheres, and this is across a number of countries, where you see private sector is willing to solve the problems, government is willing to solve the problems. But again, the issue of the connection between uh, the interest seems not to be ironed in a manner that uh, we would like to see um, at this particular stage. What is the biggest challenge in my view lies on knowing what to do. And I think we all know our problems. It's not an issue of us going to find what problems uh, are there to be solved. And the 4IR aspect then presents a good opportunity for us to then collaborate uh, between various entities in the country. But then again, it also opens up the need for collaboration beyond just one country. It needs, you know, um, us not to see the borders and say, how do we solve these particular problems? A problem that has been solved in Rwanda, um, 
uh, in the 4IR space using their technologies can benefit fully uh, South Africa? And how do we then make sure that those synergies are established and we, we deal with it? So I think in terms of then answering the, the question directly, the key aspect that I want to touch, to touch on here is on issue of breaking the silo mentality and making sure that there's a very strong uh, collaboration between industry and government um, and making sure that again, we can see beyond the borders. So maybe let me pause here uh, for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, very clear. I will, uh, I will certainly get back to you uh, on, on some of the recommendations that you made and connect them with actually a couple of questions uh, that were asked by Dr. Mayaki, but also connected with uh, some of the recommendations made by uh, Prof, by uh, Madam Christina Duarte on the sustainable financing. And, uh, you know, some of also the options that we need to consider uh, to, to, to fight illicit financial flows, which is conversely actually uh, accelerated somehow by digital transformation. So my next question will be addressed to um, Nokutula Lukele from the World Economic Forum regarding the, the strategies that the strategy and actions uh, that are needed for rapid upscaling of Africa's ICT infrastructure. And uh, I would like also to connect or affix to that question, uh, the issue of financing. Uh, would, you, would you like to share your perspective and you know, through the research that you do the intergovernmental processes what recommendations uh, would you like to you would like to share with us regarding specifically the strategies and actions uh, that are needed for rapid upscaling of ICT in infrastructure in Africa and the issue related to financing? Uh, Nokutula, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, thank you, uh, Tala, and, and thank you everyone for having me. It's a it's a a, a pleasure to be a part of these discussions. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, um, I am with the World Economic Forum, uh, leading our work on digital transformation. And so we, we convene business, government, and civil society leaders to understand and shape this uh, shifting role of digital transformation and digital inclusion, uh, especially in a post-COVID normal. Um, as uh, Madam Duarte mentioned, a lot of these concepts are, are not new, but COVID has really forced us to accelerate um, the plans and the strategies that uh, we've had before. Uh, we're in a time where more and more people are, are online and, and digital, and a big risk there is uh, increasing the digital divide as we're on this road to accelerate digital transformation. And the key factor to that is um, ICT infrastructure. Uh, and and we, we all know how, how big that gap of connectivity is uh, on, on the continent. Uh, and and uh, we need to increase uh, that uh, capacity uh, to be successful and to, to thrive. We, we've recently uh, worked with uh, uh, ITU and the World Bank and the GSMA to think through some of these strategies and these actions that, that would be needed, especially in a post-COVID normal. And three, three things really surfaced for us uh, during our discussions uh, with uh, our constituents. The first is around uh, government strategies. Technology needs to underpin every aspect of the national uh, digital strategy. Um, it needs to be at the core of, of all priorities. Uh, this means that there, there needs to be an increased collaboration between ministries, uh, between the finance ministries and the ICT ministries to, to build robust digital infrastructure strategies um, and robust digital technology investment strategies. Uh, and there also needs to be collaboration with, with all the other uh, ministries because uh, technology underpins all of them. If we look at some of the priority um, areas, uh, education, healthcare, finance, all of these can be advanced to such a bigger degree with uh, technology. And so 
increasing that collaboration between ministries is important. Um, and as mentioned before, ensuring that the there is a conducive regulatory environment uh, for the rollout of these strategies uh, is key. So, so that's the first one, in, ensuring that digital is at the core of, of all national priorities. Um, the second is, is around funding. We're, we're in an unprecedented uh, time where uh, there's a, a, a lot of stimulus um, being provided for, for recovery during this pandemic. Uh, and, and to ensure longer term sustainability and resilience and value uh, for the, the continent, we need to make sure that a portion of that stimulus, a, a portion of those funds are being earmarked um, to digitize industries, especially small and medium enterprises who make up the bulk of our economies. Um, and especially uh, digital infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, the third uh, recommendation that surfaced to the top was around optimizing the right mix of technologies. And, and, and this is really around making sure that we're, when we're collaborating with industry providers, innovators, entrepreneurs, that we're choosing the right mix of technologies to solve our key priorities. Um, this is as opposed to uh, creating competing technologies. Uh, it, it, it's, it's similar to having a, a hybrid solution to, to your technology strategy. And, and this will be key for, for the acceleration and for these um, uh, public-private partnerships that are needed for the rollout. Um, I, I, I also want to highlight a, a few things that, that are needed as these strategies for ICT infrastructures are being rolled out to ensure that um, they don't further exacerbate these divides. The first is around the youth. Uh, this has been mentioned before, but it, it's the link between a thriving youth and a thriving economy is clear. Um, these are our future leaders, future providers, uh, uh, future consumers, future solution providers. Uh, so we really need to make sure that as we're building in our ICT strategies, we understand that it's not just about the technology. There is a whole ecosystem around that, the youth, the small and medium businesses, the, the workforce that needs to be upskilled and, and reskilled. There, there are so many elements that should be running in parallel adjacently to the rollout of, of um, ICT infrastructure strategies. I'll leave it there um, because I know there's, you know, there's an abundance of uh, research that's been well documented by the World Bank, the UN, Broadband Commission, GSMA, World Bank, um, Alliance for Affordable Internet, um, the World Economic Forum. So, you know, this is, this is not new. W what is new is that the, the pandemic has forced us to revisit these actions urgently and implement them to accelerate digital inclusion. Uh, thank you, uh, Tala. I'll hand over to you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, that's that's very clear and uh, indeed connects uh, with, you know, the regulatory framework that you talk about, uh, the role of government, the inclusive approach uh, that needs to be spearheaded. You know, particularly with the youth, uh, how investment could be could be sort of uh, spurred or injected uh, in African economies to sustain, you know, the the, the, the development of digital. Uh, transformation. And that leads actually to the question that I would like to ask to Brandon Pascal uh, with regard to uh, incentives to put in place, uh, for instance, tax, redu tax reductions, uh, waivers to drive local digital solutions, et cetera, et cetera, that could actually spur, accelerate this, uh, this adoption. So Brandon, this question is for, is for you. Uh, what could be government incentives, for instance, tax reductions, uh, tax reductions, waivers, uh, et cetera, to drive local digital solutions. Over to you, Brandon. 
Yeah, thanks, Tala. Um, I'll, I'll really just speak to a few examples, and I know they can be contextualized to the various countries that are listening and represented here. So it's not the solution, it's just a solution that we've applied here at the, at the tip of the continent. Um, well, there's a few solutions in there that we'll get to. One specifically on the tax solution or the a tax incentive is there's a vehicle that's been set up by the government called a, a Section 12J uh, investment fund. And basically, there's minimums that an individual must put into the fund. And of that, you can, you can basically write that off of your taxes up to a certain point. So if you put money into an investment fund, it's almost like you've given it to a nonprofit entity. So here they're called Section 18As if you give it to a nonprofit. But this Section 12J is an investment fund that the government incentivizes you to put into, and then the fund has to invest in certain companies. So one, they have to be domiciled in South Africa. So the company has to have its headquarters in South Africa and its primary operations here. And then interesting things in the fund is that it not not more than one or one investor cannot invest more than 20% of the capital. So it has to be broad. You can't just be a family office or an individual and say, I'm going to set up a 12J fund. And then you put all your money in that and then you write off your taxes. So it has to be a separate entity with at least five different people putting into the fund. And on the other side, you have to invest in at least five investments. So no more than one investment can have more than 20% of the total capital of the fund. So the point of that is to invest in new digital solutions, new digital businesses, or just general growing the economy. Um, it has been, there have been loopholes that have been abused a little bit and they're closing up those loopholes. But the, the point of it all was really to bring tax incentives to grow digital and innovative and technology-based businesses to invest in those things and to give the average average person access to invest in that way. Normally, it's just your big funds like um, here, Coronation and Liberty. But higher, higher income individuals have been able to put money into these funds. It also gives a, a different scale of individuals or a different sector of individuals access to invest in their peers that are other entrepreneurs. So that that for one is something that's that's been used pretty prolifically the last several years. The, it's been around more than 10 years, but the last four years there was a, a update to the act that then made it a little easier and more clear on how to get uh, money into that. And there's a, a massive tax incentive on that. And I think that's one example that could be contextualized across many different places, depending on what works there. But I think also there's what's not spoken of very much is immigration. And it's something that we battle with here. And I know we in South Africa, we've been in the press negatively to the rest of the continent around um, xenophobia and all of that. But the majority of the population is actually very welcoming. And there's there's some immigration um changes or tweaks that could be made i know i've seen in the press lately rwanda is creating a startup act also kenya and ethiopia i've seen different reports in different places about similar acts coming into play there but i think as globalization is a thing it's not going to go away and more there's more nationalization coming which is not always the most helpful thing be proud of your nation but also understand that people are different but I think in particular immigration to bring in digital skills that we might not yet have, really just to accelerate the growth and the learning of what's been learned in other places in the world where we can not repeat those learnings, but build on learnings as you're growing a digital economy and becoming more competitive globally. Um, so I hope that that's two, one, quite specific with an example that we've applied here, a tax incentive in the Section 12J investment fund really to get more capital into the small business and the technology and innovation uh, commercial investment space, as well as just immigration um, upgrades and changes and maybe some reform 
to follow for South Africa, we're trying to follow the lead of Rwanda and Kenya and others that have gone before us in being much more forward looking and progressive in these startup acts. But I think that in particular, uh, the immigration thing is one place that we could really learn a lot from and really try to tweak, especially as this is the AU, the African Union. Um, how can we really create more more momentum together and not divide more? So thanks, Tala. I hope I've I've ticked a couple of the boxes that you were looking for there. No, absolutely. Thank, thank you very much, Jacques. Maybe just a quick heads up uh, related to uh, what Launch Lab does, you know, because I think uh, it's a platform that is uh, good to know, uh, particularly with regard to the connection between academic research and uh, solution development yes. and the involvement of the youth and entrepreneur. Yeah, apologies for that. I'm, I'm so used to promoting what all the companies are doing that we work with that I, I forget about what Launch Lab does. Um, so Launch Lab is Stellenbosch University startup incubator. We were initially created to help them commercialize technology and innovation coming out of research at the university, but that's a third of what we work with. The other two thirds are businesses from around primarily South Africa now, but we're looking to expand on that. And in the last five years that we've been operating in earnest, we've worked with more than 200 companies. Um, we've seen the companies that we work with. So 35 of those companies have raised funding, more than 200 million Rand. And in our context, there's very little capital available. Um, that's the size of a full venture capital fund where we play. So we've seen a full fund deployed in our companies over the last five years. And uh, the UBI, University Business Incubators Global, has selected us through a benchmarking process as the number one university-linked incubator on the continent. So we're, we're very proud of that and hoping to, to represent Africa on the, the global top 10 rankings very soon as we continue to make an impact and add value. Absolutely. So, so thank you very much. I think that's a, that's a good best, best practice uh, that uh, the African Union uh, Development Agency, NEPAD, uh, is, is quite happy to, to, to sort of leverage, to, to document and share the best practices and build some commonalities and cross fertilization across the continents. Uh, with different academic and research institutions. Uh, maybe we, we have 25 minutes left and we want, would like to give time uh, for questions from the floor. We have a few questions actually that were sent to us. Uh, but prior to that, maybe uh, before I get back to Jacques DeVos on some of the specific uh, you know, solutions and framework that they put together connected with government that address the issue of financing, I would like maybe to ask these questions to, to both uh, Dr. Meaki, the CEO of uh, African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, and Madame Duarte, uh, with regard to the role of, um, you know, multilateralism, uh, but over and beyond that, actually, what, and to be very specific, uh, how the African Union as, you know, as a regional uh, body, you know, could uh, play a much bigger role and leveraging through the partnership uh, with the United Nations. So there are some partnership framework in place, uh, particularly in the area of development where I think we have some loopholes uh, that could be filled, uh, particularly with this very, with this very exciting uh, opportunity of digital transformation post-COVID and uh, vice versa, UN uh, African Union. And I think that will also give an opportunity to Madame Duarte to, to shed lights on the, the critical role of the Office of Special Advisor in Africa, uh, which to my view is a linchpin within the United Nations system uh, that brings together you know, the different component of the system to really um, focus on a global contribution to Africa's development uh, and also monitoring the, the commitments you know, from donors, uh, development, development partners, but also the domestic resource mobilization, I think is important. And connected to that, uh, you have the whole uh, activity that revolves around actually advocacy. I think advocating around the issues of that you've talked about here, the opportunities uh, could fit very well the report on NEPADS that the office put together in collaboration with many partners to highlight some of the issues and recommendations that are made here. So the question is for both uh, Dr. Mayaki and uh, Madame Duarte. Dr. Mayaki, over to you. Uh, I, I will let Christina start. Okay, let's start. Okay. Let's start. Thank you, thank you, Mayaki. 
um, herpetologists <laughs> put on the table very, very tough questions. Uh, the first one, multilateralism and, uh, uh, and the role of multilateralism versus digital economy. Tala, uh, for me, and I will be very open, there is no way that we can discuss multilateralism versus digital e economy without addressing globalization. Uh, I have been defending the idea that you have two types of multilateral organizations, two types. You have this set of multilateral organizations that basically have paid the way, have paved the way to globalization. The rules of the game, nobody's offended. Paved the way to, to, to globalization. Then you have the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. It's okay, the rules of the game. But all we know that globalization, by its nature, the, its DNA, produces the imbalances, inequality. Is new? No, it's not new. So then came the second set of multilateral institutions, whose main goal or main, I would say, main task is to try to compensate, to cancel, to balance, I would say to compensate the unbalances produced by, by globalization. After 40 years of this game, of these two types of multilateral organizations, the ones that paved the way to globalization and the ones that were supposed to go cleaning the, the imbalances, what happened after 50 years? It's simple. The, the, uh, the portion of the income to capital grew 240%. And salaries just increased by 0.5%. So the, the set of institutions that dealt or were supposed to deal with the imbalances basically failed. This is the reason that MDGs, as of today, is considered unfinished business. And digital economy in the middle of this, of this trade-off. Digital economy, if we look very well, has been one of the accelerators, the catalyzers of globalization. As simple as that. So now we do have a challenge. We do have a real challenge. It's time to bring, to make digital economy also an important tool for nations social development. Because the world is not made only by globals. There are nations. And within the, these nations, there are people. And we have in Africa 420 million people below poverty line. So it's time to make this game much more balanced. And digital economy, despite the fact, despite the, fact the risks, and the mitigants, as I mentioned, is a policy obligation in order to balance these two sides of the equation. Regarding the, if I understood, the advocacy, uh, as you know, uh, OSA, the office that I, I, I have the privilege to lead now, one of the functions is advocacy. And this written. Advocacy for what? Advocacy to mobilize international community for, Ar for Africa's development. I have to confess you, Tala and Mayaki. I have been having problems to understand this sentence. Because Africa belongs to the international community. I can't understand why we put, we put Africa outside the international community. And we say that advocacy is essentially to mobilize international community for Africa, if Africa belongs to the international community, and belongs in a very strong way. 
belongs in a very strong way. The most important global value chains starts with ne African natural resources. So I have been trying to understand this sentence. So I do believe we need to reconceptualize advocacy with respect to African development. And reconceptualizing by basically mobilizing ourselves, mobilizing ourselves as Africans for our own development. And I do believe this is the type of advocacy that we need to deliver. Mobilize ourselves for our own development. This is the reason that uh, in my remarks, I mentioned financing for development, yes, indeed, from inside, from inside. Does not make sense, Tala. With the right end, Africa loses, according to UNTAD, $90 billion in illicit financial flows. With our right end, and, what, and with our left end, we beg for money. We beg for money. And you need to, 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 to use debt reliefs and debt suspensions to cope with COVID-19 crisis. So there is here a paradox. There is a paradox. Maybe at the end of the day, we are borrowing from international financial markets. Our own money, and this is a question, without offending nobody. Maybe at the end of the day, I will repeat my question. Maybe at the end of the day, Africa is borrowing its own money and pay interest on its own money. So financing for development needs to be reconceptualized. And in this reconceptualization, as well as advocacy, in this reconceptualization, we need to reconcept, re reconceptualize advocacy and putting the epicenter again in Africa. And this is my, my response. Thank you, Tala. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Dr. Maggi, over to you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Tala. And I I will not touch on the issue of uh, multilateralism and globalization, but was very uh, um, rightly and correctly painted by, by Christina. Now I'll go to the question regarding what can the African Union do? The, the way uh, the African Union works is to have a strategic framework continentally and try to implement it at regional and national level. So uh, the, the uh, orientations that are given by a continental strategy uh, are like obligations that countries need to implement. Uh, evidently, in this process, you have a theory and you have a practice. Uh, the theory is a smooth implementation from a continental to a regional to a national uh, plan and uh, uh, processes. But uh, there are evidently many obstacles to that uh, because we tend to think that policy design is a rational process and that's what we learn in school. But policy design is not a rational process. Policy design is a product of interests that are uh, 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 um, uh, competing or cooperating. Uh, and these interests fundamentally shape the outcomes of a policy and how it is designed. Uh, and you can see it within a corporation, outside a corporation, within a government, and uh, uh, within international and regional organizations. 
So uh, our role uh, as a development agency is to flag what are Africa's interests in the digital economy and the digital transformation of a continent. Once we flag what are these interests, then we can think about the necessary ecosystem, which has to do with a different behavior of a state, of a government, in terms of incentives, in terms of facilitation of training, in terms of regulation, in terms of connecting uh, uh, critical stakeholders, research practitioners, uh, in terms of also uh, funding the networks that can help uh, sustain uh, homegrown solutions. So first, the first point is policy design is not a rational process. It's a construct which is based on interest which are competing or cooperating. And making sure that we are aware of Africa's interest in that digital transformation and it liaises somehow with what Christina was saying is fundamental. So what's the role of, of the African Union? And that's what it has also helped do in agriculture, in infrastructure, etc. So that's the, the, the first point. Uh, the second point is that uh, technological innovation needs an autonomy uh, and needs an autonomous dimension. So there is a, 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 a surge of energy and solutions which are coming from everywhere, uh, which the state cannot control. Uh, regulations are important, but regulations shouldn't kill innovation. And uh, amongst these innovations, uh, the role of a government is to make sure that the innovations that do correspond to the interest I was referring to are promoted. I think this is a, 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 critical, a critical point. And uh, the, the, the last point uh, on which I want to reinforce was Christina was saying, I, I'm co-chairing a UN panel on illicit financial flows. And evidently what we have seen uh, in the last nine months is that uh, illicit financial flows uh, have increased due to the use of digital solutions. So it's a, there is a, a, a double edge uh, to that, but at the same time, the digital solutions can help uh, uh, limit the illicit financial flows. So they, they, they serve to criminal purposes, uh, to tax evasion, to tax avoidance, uh, to corruption, uh, to money laundering, but at the same time, they can be an instrument which allows to uh, uh, contain uh, these uh, these phenomena, which are which are quite uh, quite important. And my my last point is that uh, if there is uh, a a domain where governments should invest more, uh, based on their interest, and within a continental strategy, it is in digital uh, transformation. It is no longer a secondary issue. It is a fundamental issue. And that will allow us uh, to preserve once again our, our interests. So the, the main question is, what are our interests in digital transformation and how can we preserve them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayaki, indeed. Um, uh, I guess um, I would like to get the perspective from practitioners uh, Jacques uh, Devos uh, regarding, you know, how to, how to build in to these solutions, digital platform that you're building, 
uh, and this question also could be could be answered uh, by Brandon regarding you know uh, the lab, the launch lab, those solutions, the incentives. How could we make sure that you know some of the functionalities that could help one accelerate uh, the cross fertilization of knowledge, uh, implement some of these sort of uh, you know uh, building blocks that will help measure you know, the impact of digital transformation uh, related, for instance, to the illicit financial flows and infuse the research and the findings, you know, into policies that the African Union, the UN together could, uh, to, could, could sort of promote uh, and bundle part of the advocacy work uh, that uh, Christina talked about earlier. So basically, Jacques, what I would like to get from you as a perspective very quickly, uh, before you open the floor uh, is, how could technology partnership best be used to support and enhance the efficiency, one, the usage and resilience of government services in Africa, being cognizant of some of those challenges and opportunities that Dr. Meaki and uh, Madame Duarte have raised. Jacques, over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tal. I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I think one of the, the I would like to say key benefits that, that we will in a couple of years time look back during to, to this very difficult pe period in time is that COVID actually forced our hand in, in evolving to, to using digital where we typically use a paper-based capability. Um, we've seen a lot of non-digital, traditional non-digital industries starting to adopt digital. And one of the key principles really was around last mile visibility. In other words, from an accountability point of view and from a shift away from a fee for service model thinking to outcome based financing thinking, the role of, of digital. And this really forced, not forced, but this really is incentive for all of the stakeholders to effectively and efficiently connect the dots. Because if we start decentralizing delivery of services, um, e-government, uh, I think there was a couple of questions around agriculture. So the role of digital and mobile specifically in allowing farmers, small scale farmers to access new markets or access financial services or access information is the, the, the means to introduce a new business model within these industries. And mobile really allow us and digital allow us to effectively connect these dots. Now, of course, you will have those stakeholders that, that, that misuse the benefit uh, for their own gain. And, and these are things that need to be addressed as, as, as in the respective markets. But from our point of view, the upside is immense in moving to outcome-based or performance-based economy. So imagine a world where I can pay a pharmaceutical company instead of a number of uh, um, vaccine vials delivered at my, let's say, Lagos uh, Harbor to paying the, the vaccine of the pharmaceutical company for the delivery of that, that vaccine to, to a child or to a citizen. So if, you, if, if we have now a COVID vaccine, and it's not if, but when, um, we need to administer that potentially to 1.3 billion people in Africa. So from a logistics and from operational point of view, this is incredible uh, complex uh, operation to, to, to run across these different markets. And the question is how will we be able to use digital and, and mobile technology to ensure efficient and a safe supply of, of making these, these vaccines available uh, to, to our communities in the different countries. And having that last mile visibility will introduce accountability for both public and private uh, sector stakeholders. And we believe this will ultimately, in order to answer your question, contribute to improve service delivery, improve access to services, uh, better quality services, and ultimately more cost-effective services. Um, so across the board, whether it's uh, use of digital to improve education outcomes and improve access to quality health services, more efficient, cost-effective financial systems. We believe the fact of having visibility um, across all the different stakeholder groups will allow us to be more efficient and effective as a collective. I just want to add one more comment, and I know we pressed for time, but 
I can't overemphasize the importance of, of supporting our entrepreneurs. Um, the, the launch lab that was mentioned earlier, the company that I represent is, is the output of, of a, a launch lab initiative where the university and government supported a group of entrepreneurs to take their idea, which was at the time just the idea, and make that commercially available in Africa. And today, as we speak, 66 million people are directly impacted and serviced with, with the offerings that, that we've developed. So that's just one example. And I think we need to share these stories with one another of government supporting academic institutions, supporting entrepreneurs and take their ideas to market and bridge that gap between basic research, applied research, and something that's of economic benefit to the citizens of, of Africa. So I would like to, to encourage all the, the colleagues and attendees on this call to look at what the Launch Lab is doing as a, as a model that we can replicate across the different African markets and, and produce uh, companies that can deliver solutions for, 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 for the continent. And there's such a abundance of opportunities from an entrepreneur point of view. Um, there's such a, a lot of smart individuals, smart uh, startup companies that's got great ideas, but they just fail in bridging that gap um, and in scaling up the solution and impacting lives. Um, so as a collective, I believe we can, we can make a, a significant contribution and um, we are connecting the dots between government's involvement, policy regulations, creating a conducive environment uh, to do business and then leveraging the, the three key benefits of digital, which is it's free, it's perfect and it's instant. And in order to give that benefit to the citizens in our resource limited settings, we need to improve our rural coverage. And in order to do this, we need new business models to allow us to deliver services in these communities. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jacques. So I'm gonna I'm gonna open the floor for for five minutes to to take questions from the floor uh, that could be addressed directly to the to the panelists. Uh, before we, before a last round of questions, a uh, last round of intervention rather from the panelists uh, to share their, you know, kind of takeaways. And then uh, my colleague Martin will uh, try to summarize in three minutes, you know, the key takeaways, key action points. And, uh, and then we'll conclude this uh, very interesting dialogue that we had. So the floor is, the floor is open. So I saw uh, two hands raised. Um, okay. So we can start taking taking questions now. The the floor is open. They are hand raised, but uh, I'm not sure if. Um, our guests uh, are having problem to to speak. Okay, that's fine. All right. So while I'm waiting for for questions to to come back on the screen, uh, maybe I will just uh, ask very very quickly, Madam Madam Gassama, if you could. Um, sort of uh, elaborate on uh, one of the issues that were that was raised we talked about the mechanism earlier and the policies require uh, but uh, what what do you think should be done uh, with regard in terms of policies with regard to multinational solutions you know spreading across the continent uh, madame gasamo you have the floor well thank you um, tala uh, what policies would be required to stimulate uh, local solutions rather than dependency on big multinational solutions? It's a great question. Um, indeed, we have to recognize that it's a great challenge for local companies to compete with multinationals, which have colossal financial, technical, logistic resources. Mm -hmm. However, 
I think that by promoting niche strategies policies based on the proximity to local customers, based on a better knowledge of their these SMEs will be best positioned than multinationals to gain substantial market shares at the local level. Okay. By offering innovative the best that we will not only be able to develop locally, but able to penetrate foreign markets. And as Dr. Mayaki said earlier, Okay, I think, I think we're having a connectivity issue with Madame Gassamo. So let me maybe switch to the question from the floor while we reconnecting Madame Gassamo. I see, I recognize uh, Mr. Raul Antonio de Melo Cabral uh, who has a question. Thank you. Merci, Talat. Est-ce que tu peux m'entendre? Oui, oui, oui. Allez-y, allez-y. Ok, d'accord. Merci, merci beaucoup, Talat. Et félicitations à, 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 au professeur Mayaki. Félicitations à Aouda Nepad. Félicitations à toi-même euh, pour cet événement. Et félicitations aussi à mon patron, à le USG, Madame Duarte, pour euh, pas seulement pour le contenu, mais aussi pour euh, pour la passion avec laquelle elle a fait sa présentation. Uh, uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, as you, uh, uh, Guterres spoke about, uh, about the need uh, for solidarity with the people and government of African in, Africa in tackling COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic is affecting African countries differently, as we know, given uh, varieties of strengths and vulnerability. Uh, this also could represent, uh, of course, uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, but uh, as we all know, uh, these hopes uh, could be uh, dashed away, not only uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that is provoking force and forcing upwards of uh, 100 million people into extreme poverty, but it will also reshape what extreme poverty uh, looks according to the, uh, the new uh, report or analysis from the, from the, the World Bank. Uh, yes, Africa, uh, by and large, uh, do not have the highest rate of infections and death as compared to uh, other parts of the world. However, we do know that for various reasons, the measures to stem or to put brakes to the spread of the virus COVID-19 could exacerbate, and I put emphasis here, could exacerbate existing conflicts and generate new and even more complex, complex conflicts. So my question is, what type of actions could this meeting advise to the policymakers, uh, governments in Africa to prevent the negative impact? And the second point is that uh, USG Duarte mentioned also the question of partnerships that I, for one, believe it is uh, uh, extremely of extreme importance, the importance of strategic partnerships for innovation. Is there any recommendation from this distinguished platform in terms of necessity to have a specific COVID-19 agreement that expands the focus, scope and scale of Africa uh, within the Europe, Asia, it was mentioned here, the question of multilateral institutions, including the United Nations and the rest of the world vis-a-vis -vis to, uh, to this situation that uh, the world is facing. And uh, what would be really uh, the, the, the strategy or the, the, the policies that will be put in place for the next uh, 10 to 20 years? And yet again, what role the United Nations will be playing in this entire uh, process. A concrete recommendation that should be coming or would be coming from this very distinguished uh, panel. Once again, Tala, I'm so proud of you and thank you very much for uh, this. We definitely need more and not less of these type of platforms. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Raul. So while our panelists, uh, including our keynote speakers, are uh, preparing their answers, which I'm sure they, they're ready to, to, to give to Raul, I'm going to take the second um, uh, question from the floor. I recognize Lloyd Mashita. Lloyd, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tala. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first and foremost uh, acknowledge uh, the, 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 the heads, um, uh, Professor Mayaka, uh, USG. Uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, gracing us with your presence and, uh, and yourself, Tala, for this platform that you've obviously created to uh, help us uh, uh, come together and uh, join to obviously for one cause. Um, I'd like to first and foremost um, uh, share more or less uh, uh, from a point of view where my background is. Um, I've, I've got a podcast called The Africa Digital World, and uh, we've decided to take it upon us uh, to obviously create a discourse where we're obviously highlighting the issue of YR and its relevance in Africa. And um, with, with that as well, funny enough, just yesterday we had a recording with, uh, with the CEO of Launch Lab. Uh, Josh uh, Roshmir and uh, the team at Launch Lab is doing fantastic work where we're obviously trying to unpack and see how best we can, uh, as Africa, come and break down the respective silos uh, where we all understand that we all, before, before COVID-19 came in, there was the one pandemic, not just the one pandemic, but uh, we've obviously had issues of financial inclusion, job creation, women and youth empowerment, all of those uh, Blank, put put them under one blanket and uh, how important it is for digital transformation at a time like this for Africa. And um, we were on a verge, we're actually on the verge of obviously unpacking to see how best technology itself can be used to transform and uh, solve these uh, solve these problems. And um, with what Launch Lab is obviously doing, no, with what Launch Lab is doing, I would like to then equate it to what uh, would be probably the equivalent of uh, Silicon Valley, if, if, if anything else. And um, how best would, um, and my question would then be, what is uh, the United, what is the, what is not just the United Nations, but uh, AU doing to align the respective regions and the respective uh, uh, blocks to, to, to literally uh, govern and put in regulatory measures that help not just protect uh, the, the, the inventions that come out of Africa, but as well as also to protect, uh, like I think it was uh, Brendan who mentioned it from a migration perspective. I know Europe is, uh, Europe is, uh, is taking it very serious where they're actually allowing for entrepreneurs to actually come in with solutions and allowing for permits and stuff like that. What, what is the AU's approach in this regard? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Lloyd. Your, your, your question is well captured. I will repeat it to, um, to the panelists uh, if necessary. Thank you very much for your contribution. I would like to recognize uh, Haladu Salah. Uh, Haladu, you have the floor. Haladu, you have the floor. Hello, you're muted. So, uh, François Charrier. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, François. Yes, man. Uh, thank you for this panel. It was really interesting. Um, one question was raised by the USG, Christina Duarte, regarding the importance of regulatory framework uh, in the face of this giants, uh, the MAGA, you know, the Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Apple. Um, but this issue is not only for Africa. Every country in the world is facing that problem that they have to deal with giants. So maybe we should have a, a world regular, regulatory body, not just at the national or African level. So it's just a question I'm, I'm raising here. Because even in the USA, they have issue with this MAGA. As you know, they don't pay taxes in the US and, and in, uh, in European Union, they try to file a a major claim with the island for billions of euros and uh, the court of justice actually overrule that decision and um, so basically the 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 was apple i think won that case of billions of euros 
So it shows how even the European Union could not basically uh, face uh, such a giant. So I think maybe it's a world issue, not just a, a con African issue. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Thank you for your contribution. Um, Hala, do you have the floor? That's the last uh, request we got from the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, I mean, dialogue and uh, a key issue for the future of uh, Africa. This is why I'm asking just one quick question. What could be the role of digitalization in contributing to attract young people into agriculture. Thank you very much, up to you. Thank you very much, Aladu. Very, very, very specific question. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. So I'm just going to recapitulate for the sake of our panelists to, to take the freedom to answer to, to those questions. So the last question I think was quite straightforward. The role of digitalization to create more incentive for uh, the youth actually to get involved in agriculture. I, I know there are some solutions uh, rolled out by uh, Medzenin, for instance. Francois Charlier talk about, um, you know, the issue of regulatory framework that countries around the world are facing vis-a-vis -vis the MAGA. So what should be done? Should we have a global body, global recommendations, whatever the role of the United Nations, the African Union is going to be? It's a very straightforward question. Uh, the question related to, um, you know, I, uh, our, our colleague who asked the question related to the work that uh, our Launch Lab is doing, you know, similar to what is happening in the Silicon Valley. Actually, I, I witnessed this firsthand because I was there last week. And indeed, I, 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 I recognize that is what's happening. So his question relates to what's the AU uh, plus the UN uh, could do to build sort of, uh, uh, you know, put together regulatory frameworks to protect uh, African economies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, African nations, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the downside of digital, digital transformation. Um, and we had a question from uh, Raul, two questions from Raul uh, de Cabral. What type of action to prevent the negative impact of digitalization uh, within the current context uh, where it could actually spur, uh, you know, innovation to, to, to fight COVID and sustain uh, the recovery of African countries, which is very much in line with the theme of this dialogue. And his second question relates to strategic um, uh, partnership to put in place, uh, you know, for all these uh, regulatory framework that you talk about. Uh, but I guess uh, what is, just to summarize what he was saying, how could we leverage through partnership uh, together to, to size up the opportunities and potential that digital transformation uh, is, is providing to all of us to, to leverage. Uh, the distinguished panelists, uh, I'm, I'm giving the floor. Maybe I will just um, start with uh, Madame Duarte, Christina. Uh, Okay, I was going to switch to, to you, Dr. Meyaki. On which question? There are so many questions. Yeah, uh, any of these questions? Yeah, if you want me to repeat them, maybe, but uh, if, if, you, if you can pick any of the questions. Okay, so let me, on the issue, uh, on the question which was uh, asked by uh, Raul Melo Cabral on uh, could the uh, pandemic have a negative impact uh, regarding the conflicts. Uh, I guess is liaising that with digital solutions. Uh, my, my answer is really, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what uh, we do know is that uh, generally uh, conflicts in the continent are, are decreasing. Uh, but the fact that they are decreasing uh, does not mean that all the root causes of a conflict have been erased. But uh, certainly, factually, uh, they, they are decreasing. Let us have that figure in mind. Less than 7% of Africans live in regions where there are conflicts. Uh, but 
evidently uh, the root causes are not uh, are not uh, uh, have not been erased and uh, I, I would not spend too much time on the question but it is interesting to see uh, that uh, um, uh, digital solutions are also being used by terrorists as you know uh, especially in the Sahel region uh, from Boko Haram to, to, the, to the jihadists and uh, um, the security forces in that region uh, need to improve their digital capacities in order to fight uh, the, the So let me, the second question, which I think was asked was the, the role of uh, digital solution in order to improve uh, uh, small scale farmers productivity. Uh, there are many solutions which do exist already. Uh, and you have even illiterate small scale farmers who can use applications that allow them to uh, 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 have information on markets, that allow them to uh, improve their uh, agricultural techniques. So this can be uh, uh, evidently uh, enhanced and it is within uh, the Malabo Declaration of the African Union uh, to make sure that uh, digital solutions are, are indeed enhanced. And we have uh, uh, staff in outer Nepal who are working on, 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 on these issues. Uh, so be, uh, beyond the questions, I wanted to make uh, two remarks. Um, the first one is uh, the, uh, the capacity that Africa had in order to respond to COVID uh, uh, was fundamentally by using the African Union architecture. This is what has allowed us to, to not uh, suffer uh, as much as, uh, as, uh, as other regions of the world. Uh, 32,000 deaths, 1 million, billion, 300 million inhabitants. 32,000 deaths is equal to the number of deaths in the city of New York. Uh, so it, it, it is a, an achievement which cannot be uh, uh, um, relegated to a haphazard type of reaction. It was a strongly coordinated reaction through the CDC. And there also, uh, the national CDCs that were created, the 37 national CDCs, did use digital solutions in order uh, to uh, not only uh, educate, but collect data, uh, work on networks. So that was uh, a, a remarkable uh, type of achievement using digital solution. My, my last point will be, uh, which was referred to by many of the panelists um, uh, and starting by Christina. Uh, digital solution did exist before COVID-19 and were spread in the continent uh, through many innovations. Now we realize that we should do more and better. And uh, in doing more and better, uh, it's evident that uh, the partnership between uh, states, governments, and the private sector, and the multiplicity of innovators throughout the continent. These partnerships need to be, uh, to be created because we have a common interest. I insist on, 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 on that uh, aspect, which is the, the common interest. And it's the role of the African Union to make sure that this common interest is, uh, is preserved. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayaki. Um, maybe before, uh, before I give the floor to Martin to just sort of recap, you know, the key findings and recommendations, uh, I will uh, give one minute uh, uh, to each of the panelists, uh, starting with uh, Professor Gassama, uh, either to answer the questions that, were, that came from the floor or just to give their sort of closing remark, one minute each. Madam Gassama, you have the floor. Thank you, Tala. 
Uh, for some uh, questions, uh, one is uh, linked to uh, the importance of, of data. Data, uh, mainly in uh, artificial intelligence, is uh, crucial. And we need uh, numerous data, but also diversified data. If you, have a, if you want to have a strong uh, model on the algorithm. So the problem, as you said, is uh, it's not a problem of African countries, but it's a global problem. Uh, so Af uh, European Union have uh, prepared a framework um, for all the, all the country of European Union. And African Union, uh, I think, is working on a continental strategy for um, artificial intelligence. And at national level, some countries like Tunisia, like Egypt, like South Africa, have their own strategy on uh, data, uh, how access, uh, how they, this data can be accessed, uh, and how can they be sharing and protected. Uh, so there is some attempt in Africa uh, to uh, organize this data because it's fundamental if you want to move to this economy of uh, this digital economy. Uh, uh, one point I would like just to, to share, uh, just to say what Mr. Dr. Mayaki said earlier, uh, I believe that you can only develop what you have in yourself. And there can no be no there can be no development when you take exogenous paths. So the continent needs to reinvent its own paradigm and recognize its indigenous knowledge. As the second point is uh, the informal sector. Africa have a very dynamic and very important informal sector, uh, which is recognized as the driving force in our African economy. So we need for digital solution also to target approaches to strengthening this, uh, uh, this informal sector using some curricula in TVET and uh, focusing on some area of skills that are relevant uh, to emerging needs in this digital technology. And uh, this is something what uh, we oftenly we forget in our strategies, in our policies. Uh, we need to focus in this informal sector and uh, help them uh, to for um, ownership of this uh, digital technology. Uh, also another point I, I want also to, to highlight that we need to respond to these changes and capacity development should also inculcate, inculcate problem solving abilities. This is not mainly in uh, academia, in universities. Uh, we are not always uh, uh, formatted in critical thinking, in problem sol solving abilities. So we need to contextualize, to contextualize our technology and address to Africa's identified challenge. And I think that, that way skills development will be coached to be innovative and needful. Thank you, Tala. Thank you, Professor Mugasa. Well, art well articulated. Thank you very much again. Uh, Nokutula, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I want to briefly address uh, two questions that were asked and then uh, uh, touch on some final thoughts. Uh, but uh, in terms of the regulatory framework, I think uh, what's interesting during this time is that there's been an increased collaboration between competition and policy regulators across the globe, which is something we, we haven't seen to this extent before. And the discussions have moved from, should we uh, regulate uh, dominant players to how do we regulate dominant players? And, and, and that's a huge shift because once we move away from that existential question, we move towards closer towards implementation of policy. Um, and, and, the, and the big questions uh, on, well, one of the questions on, the, on regulators' minds is, uh, are the existing frameworks 
that uh, we can use uh, for ex-ante regulation? And, and if not, how do we make sure the new frameworks that we introduce do not have unintended uh, consequences? Now, these are two very big questions. Um, but, but to see that uh, global cross-pollination of ideas and insights among competition policy, uh, policy makers and regulators is, is very encouraging and a big step forward um, for the continent. Um, and, and on uh, attracting youth into, into agriculture, Halado, uh, I, I think 4IR technology has changed what the future of work is gonna look like in every industry. And so in agriculture, there's gonna be a lot more technology adopted around interoperable data, um, AI, uh, automation of processes, and, and these will require new skills and new demand. The youth is, is the future workforce. And uh, with these new skills, uh, there's going to be an, an increased attraction for, for what the youth is educated in and, and what capabilities we build in them. And so that's one key way to attract the youth into agriculture through digital transformation. Um, but my, my final thoughts is that, uh, you know, there were so many uh, challenges brought up on this call and, and, and solutions that um, could address a lot of those. Uh, and I think that uh, what Dr. Mayaki mentioned is, is, is very key we need to prioritize what we're solving for. And then the technologies to um, enable those solutions or, or support those, those uh, questions um, to, ha to have a really clear path towards impact uh, and, uh, and avoid uh, what we call a, 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 a kind of a, a piloting, uh, uh, circle where it, it's small pilots that, that never fully scale to, to impact. Um, we need to make sure on the continent and uh, uh, Madam Duarte spoke to this, that we increase resilience. And, and this isn't only a question that's been asked in Africa. When we have discussions in other regions, the big question post COVID is, how do I make sure I'm resilient when something like this happens again? when we have to shut borders, when we can no longer trade in the way that we used to, what's the strategy? And it always comes back to the same thing, local products, local solutions, local suppliers. And this is a key opportunity for Africa to do the same. In fact, not just an opportunity, but a necessity um, for economic thriving, but also for preparedness and resilience for any other uh, disruptions. So thank you again for, for having us. And, and this was a very riveting uh, discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lokutula. Uh, your points are very well articulated and well taken. Uh, Prof. Lufilo, over to you. Prof, go ahead. You're, I think you're muted now. OK, go ahead. We can't hear you, you are muted. Okay, sorry. Um, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe for me, just to, to move towards the end, I'll just uh, maybe respond to what Mr. Raul raised. And I'll just draw from some, some of the experience that we had at the CSIR in terms of fighting the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Without getting into the details, so the CSIR was involved a number of projects to support the state and its readiness. So we worked on, a, on, on projects that, for instance, varied from modeling the spread to focusing the number of cases and the deaths, um, predicting how many people are going to be in ICU, how many will need ventilators. And of course, to do that, we had to work with a number of uh, partners. But what was very interesting in the process was that, um, and maybe this is the point that I'm going to come to just now, we also work on a number of projects where, for instance, we had to create interactive maps to look into the vulnerable communities, um, just to see how they are affected. Uh, we had to create, for instance, information centers for various departments, Department of Health, which we expanded this to become a decision support center uh, for the other departments as well, so that when they make decisions, they can come to one data point. Um, we had to create mobility uh, platforms to allow anonymized uh, a, a flow of um, data about individuals where in case somebody was infected and they moved to, to another region, you can sort of start tracking them. But of course, in a particular way, 
uh, and that is safe, that's in line with the Poppy Act, protection of personal information, and so forth. At the same time, we were doing various projects, for instance, look into the support for a higher education uh, to provide online learning. Where do the students reside? Do they have uh, mobile coverage? Uh, do they have devices? And so forth. And we way to look into all of these projects uh, at the same time. One thing that then became a common theme in a number of these projects, and I'm just giving you a very short snapshot of, of those projects, was the issue that Madam Gassame mentioned about the data aspect, which relates to the AI component, but is beyond the AI. I think it's something that goes uh, across the aspect of uh, creating models. One thing that is a challenge at the moment is that as Africa, uh, as Africa, we don't necessarily create our own data. So for us to create some of these models, we have to depend on the data that's coming from Europe, or from Asia, and so forth. But it's just saying, where's African data? So maybe just to, to summarize this, I will propose that maybe one thing that, or rather a few things that we need to do in, in that aspect uh, that we've learned is that we need to have data ecosystems that are unified with appropriate data governance protocols. That's a very critical aspect. We need to intensify the sharing uh, of data across the continent. And to do this, probably we might need to create common data centers. Uh, we, we might have to make the common tools available for all of us to make sure that you know, we can design fit for purpose a regulatory framework that will both stimulate innovation while minimizing harm. If you look at, for instance, uh, Mr. Raul raised an issue of an example of uh, uh, um, 100 million people who are poor, who have been pushed even further into, into poverty. You look at the models that were done to do that. They were not done by Africans. They were not done in Africa. The question is, why is that the case? Why aren't we then driving those and being able to, to drive our own courses? We need a very great transparency and accountability, not just of the individuals, but even of the algorithms that we, we are creating. We I must have faith in the algorithm that is, say, that is predicting something. But we can't do that until we are developing our own algorithms. And that's a very critical part in my view. We need to also uh, support and stimulate private sector and academic research partnership. I think we saw it working very well in our space, um, but uh, I think much more can still be done. But the last aspect is creating critical mass of fourth industrial revolution related skills. We don't have enough capacity across uh, or in any of our countries in Africa. So how do we then join these capacities to, to the point that we can then start working together? to then start having multidisciplinary and trans, uh, transdisciplinary cooperation between study fields. Uh, what COVID taught us at the moment was that, you know, the areas or the fusion between various areas is now very seamless. Somebody in humanities can work with somebody in AI, can work with somebody in epidemiology, can work with a doctor in the prediction. So we, we are starting to see this joining of these fields. And I think that is something that we need to, uh, to get to. As a last word here, uh, program director, we know that the digital transformation is, a very, is very critical for Africa, and it has to impact us with our challenges that are unique. So Africa must solve its own problems. We must transform in a way that is aligned to the global context, where a young population, um, largely unemployed, um, and social ills, poverty, unemployment, inequality, you can name them. The digital transformation therefore has to be very holistic and it has to go away beyond just ICT. It's not just an ICT issue, but it's not just a, digital, a digitization issue. It's holistic, it must involve a number of areas. So closing with the statement that was made by Charles Darwin was to say, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent uh, uh, that will survive, but it is the one that is most adaptable to change. And I think Africa should just be ready for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, for those last word of wisdom. And I think it's all about the agility, uh, leveraging through the partnership that underpins, uh, you know, the way we come up with this uh, topic and uh, clo in close collaboration with all of you guys. Um, so. In our closing remarks, I think we're going to highlight the partnership and the way forward. So the last word from the panelists uh, is going to be from Jacques. 
uh, to share his uh, final thoughts um, and you know, uh, benchmarks, etc. Uh, after Jacques, I will give the floor to Martin, who's heading our sense of excellence, uh, who's going to just uh, share with us actually the key takeaways from, from, from this dialogue. So Martin will have uh, three minutes for that. And uh, after, after that, we'll give back the floor to Dr. Mayaki to sort of, uh, you know, give us his blessing for the exit uh, for, from this meeting, from this dialogue. Uh, what I would like to announce before that is we, our knowledge management team is going to document uh, extensively uh, the outcome recommendations uh, from this dialogue. And uh, they will connect with the various programs uh, that we have across uh, the African Union Development Agency. We talk about data. We have a division focused on innovation and data. Uh, we have scientists uh, working within the organization who understand very much uh, those aspects. And uh, we're going to build a connection with the different uh, you know, participants, including CSIR and the private sector, the academia, to ensure that uh, we, we're going to leverage the partnership ecosystem you know, to spur and ensure that the innovation and the digital transformation is going to benefit Africa. And talking about partnership, obviously, we're going to also uh, ensure that uh, the building blocks already in place between the UN and OSA will be extended to practitioners such as, um, you know, Vodacom and others, the, the Launch Lab and the tech, techpreneurship ecosystem that exists across the continent that flourish. Uh, and to make sure that we build a connection between, uh, like I said earlier, policy recommendation and action, but also translating some of the academic research findings, very interesting uh, to, 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 to real solutions and ensuring that uh, the youth is involved and regulatory framework are influenced by best practices uh, for, for, for the sake of Africa. Jacques, the floor is yours before Martin. Thank you, um, Program Director. Thanks, Tala. I think I'll be very brief. Just I've, I've, I've read some of the questions in, in the chat, uh, and there's quite a lot of uh, discussion around agriculture and um, local languages, ability to personalize the experience, which I think is, is one of the key benefits of digital. So we support about 2.2 million. Um, farmers in, in, in Africa with a digital service, uh, ranging from access to market, access to financial services, um, access to, to decision support capability. And no two farmers within this ecosystem of beneficiaries are the same. Each and every one is unique in the sense that they the, the, the position, the GPS location where they farm, the crop value chain that they participate in, when it rain, when it's planting season is unique. I can't share information about pineapples with a tomato farmer in Kaduna State in Nigeria. Um, so digital allow us to personalize the experience. So take into consideration language, culture, uh, where in the crop value chain uh, am I participating? Um, what crop value chain am I participating? And I think th this is where we, um, should support the entrepreneurs in providing local solutions. So to making the, the technology available um, to allow them to deliver a digital enabled offering to, to these farmers. So with more than uh, 100 million small the farmer families in, in, on the continent, uh, this is definitely one of the key uh, areas where digital can, can, can increase uh, per capita income, increase quality of life, and then very important from a food security point of view, ensure that, that, we, that we have enough uh, food for, for, for the citizens of the continent. So I'm quite excited to see some of the innovations that's coming out of these, these markets, universities, startup companies, um, applied research organizations like the CSIR, and I believe we have the means and, and, and the understanding to deliver uh, solutions um, by African companies for, for, for the African market. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jacques, for your contribution. Uh, Martin? Thank you. Thank you, Tala. Uh, and thank you to the keynote speakers and also the panelists. Uh, obviously, in three minutes, I would not be able to, 
pull all the richness in the in the presentations, the questions, and the discussions. Uh, and I want to assure you that uh, we're taking note of all the submissions uh, because this is, uh, as Tala mentioned in the beginning, is not a one-off thing. It's something that we're going to do. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, this is more than just a talk show. We know. Uh, African Union Development Agency together with you, we have capabilities that we can connect the outcomes of these discussions to action, to implementation. And this is why I clustered the uh, key messages out of the discussions in three components. One is a, a little bit on the scope. Then I look at uh, implementation, including uh, issues of how to get to implementation. And then uh, I summarize into those uh, action points that uh, are coming out of here. So in terms of scope, we, it was made actually in the beginning and also at various stages in the discussion uh, that uh, impl implying that digitalization we're talking about here is not the goal in itself, but is about connecting to economic growth, connecting to human well-being, uh, especially also in the context of creating more jobs and entrepreneurship opportunities. It was also mentioned that this is about how to harness knowledge and innovation to connect to policy, policy formulation, to connect to investments and also human capital and all these elements actually connecting to only the one thing, implementation and achieving results in terms of the speed, the extent of economic development on the continent. Now, when it comes to implementation, uh, it, the, the discussions acknowledge that uh, we need to be mindful of what we need to get to do. I think this has been emphasized through and through in different ways, uh, knowing what we want and uh, also appreciating then what we need to actually do and getting to do it. Uh, the discussions acknowledge that there are numerous digital solutions and in fact that uh, uh, the solution has been there pre-COVID. Uh, what COVID has done is actually to place the agency on this matter uh, and also expose some of the very critical solutions that have worked in uh, enabling Africa's response to COVID-19, but also able to actually work in strengthening the economic drive of the continent as well as the development. Uh, and we appreciate that uh, uh, as an opportunity, actually, governments are sitting up and uh, taking note of uh, the opportunities and the value that exists with regard to, uh, to the digital solutions. In terms of how to make it happen and looking at uh, indeed that we have to be deliberate on the enabling environment to either catalyze, to accelerate, and bring to scale the innovations, the solutions that are actually emerging. Sorry, I think I got uh, muted, but I'm back. Uh, and therefore, uh, in that enabling environment, actually four factors uh, can be identified. They were presented by different partners, I mean, uh, panelists, uh, but I picked the map more summarized in the in the points that the USG presented in terms of uh, strong regulatory capabilities, strong education framework and capabilities, proper enabling legal environment and and framework, and the whole issue of partnerships and actually public private partnerships as one of them, but uh, broader in terms of. Uh, cutting across both vertical and horizontal alignment and alliances in delivering together. Uh, specifically on the enabling environment, policy came out uh, also quite strongly uh, in terms of identifying the policy risks uh, and also how to identify and put our energy on those policy obligations. Um, and also <clears throat> a thing that came out was the issue of financing specifically tax incentives, for instance, and the whole investment in the digital infrastructure. So the issue of building solutions for Africa in Africa was actually made, and that is a very strong point in terms of uh, 
uh, capabilities. So it's not just embracing what is existing, but is also the capability to generate innovations uh, and solutions. I think also one critical issue made was the issue about systems approach. It was uh, presented in different form, integrated approaches, the whole coherence across different sectors and systems, uh, as well as across countries. Uh, uh, this was about across uh, sectors, health, education, food, economy as a general, uh, vertical in terms of country but to country, but also about Africa versus the some of those uh, general kind of enabling factors. So issue of entrepreneurship, especially small medium enterprises uh, as part of that capability for generating and advancing solutions within the continent, intergovernmental coherence, alignment and integrated approaches, connecting with youth empowerment, uh, uh, government strategies and how technologies should actually underpin uh, the development opportunities and priorities. Uh, issue of partnerships actually we came back several times and uh, just to acknowledge that uh, it's more than just public private actually as many people have mentioned, but also government industry and country to country. Uh, lastly, actually there's been a lot of mention around the issue of data, again, connecting to those uh, uh, regulatory framework issues of legal framework uh, and things like that. The final matter that also I picked up is uh, that they, they can be and there are negative consequences of, of digital technologies and solutions. And we need to be mindful of those and they may differ from circumstance, circumstances, but we need to take note of them and be able to prepare uh, both in terms of responses but also managing trade-offs and, and looking at uh, their ultimate impact uh, on, uh, on the overall uh, movement. So finally, in terms of action, I, I picked four points. One is uh, about enabling environment and looking at policy coherence, issue of financing, and the whole issue of skill, uh, human capital development with regard to skills and education which in fact uh, was mentioned that should start from very, very early stages. Issue of innovations, connecting innovations to local entrepreneurship, uh, as well as connecting to market. And this is about enabling that local environment for not just research, but uh, capitalization, commercialization, and moving to scale with innovations. Uh, and lastly, the whole issue of uh, uh, regulatory framework, and these are mentioning as areas where African Union Development Agency together with partners can actually already pick up at low, as low hanging fruits in terms of uh, action points. They all drive on regulatory framework and legal capabilities from countries that already have something into more regional and continental space. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, how do we continue to catalyze the issue of partnerships uh, and ensure between financing, policy, implementation, uh, as well as the regional integration that we are able to present a force that can make digital technologies uh, uh, something uh, strong in advancing economic growth and development in Africa. So thank you so much, Tala. I think let me stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin, and congratulations for capturing actually the essence and the depth and the breadth of uh, all the contribution. It's, uh, it's an outstanding work that you've done there. So we have reached the end of this, uh, this dialogue. We hope that uh, everybody benefited uh, from you know, the rich contribution we, we receive uh, graciously, I would say, from practitioners. Uh, these are people who really do the work on the ground, from policymakers, uh, you know, colleagues from the UN, from OSA, I recognize uh, contribution from the UAG of OSA and colleagues from OSA were attending. Uh, two of them asked questions, some did not, but they are, they are following. What I would like to highlight here is actually uh, structural opportunities uh, for African Union and the UN represented by OSA 
uh, with our partners, some of which participated in this um, uh, uh, knowledge series, um, and some not yet. Uh, some actually are members of the, the APET, which is chaired by Madame Gassama. Uh, just to say that, you know, this is a huge opportunity for the UN, for AU, for, you know, uh, all these Pan-African organizations that you have here as well, to work within the context of, the, of a multilateral uh, sort of dimension, to size up the scale of policy recommendations uh, that we need to use to cope with the speed at which digital transformation is impacting our lives. And uh, we have a big job to do here. Uh, the knowledge management team led by Abiola, Andriette, and other colleagues who work behind the scene. And I seize this opportunity to congratulate and thank them for the support uh, and everything that they've done to make this happen. Without them, we would not be here today talking about this. They have uh, another more important task, which is to come up with you know, the main recommendation and capture them in the document that will be used as a roadmap to engage with all of you and Martin and all the, all the colleagues across the organization will be part of it as well. So look forward to hearing from us very soon uh, to sort of action uh, most of the recommendations that you made here, either in terms of solutions, but also in terms of uh, policy recommendations that we're going to share across uh, the continent in Africa and uh, leverage our partners, uh, the UN in, in, in New York to ensure that we disseminate it well, and we get also enough feedback. This was one of um, one of the first the first knowledge series organized by the African Union Development Agency. So we're going to have more of these very very often. It is also an opportunity for us to um, do a stakeholder need analysis to ensure that the solution that we're building or the programs that we're developing across our organization speaks to need, uh, needs from, from the member states. So we wanna make sure that there is alignment and we don't, we sort of write a service provider, a demand driven, even if we think through solutions, you know, and we devise on policies, et cetera, we make sure that we vet them against needs and, uh, uh, you know, priority, development priorities of our continent. So I would like to thank you very, very, very much. So we're gonna get back to you, as I mentioned, uh, with document and recommendation and roadmap. We're going to seek your input to, to input to ensure that, you know, it's going to be a joint planning and joint programming. So our resources pull together to make sure we deliver against the expectations. Uh, thank you very much and stay safe and see you soon.